Good morning, church family. Uh, please join me as we prepare for this morning's service, and we are going to be singing I Have Decided to Follow Jesus, 517, your songbook, please. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow, though the world goes with me, still I will follow. Still I will follow No turning back No turning back Will you decide now To follow Jesus Will you decide now To follow Jesus Will you decide now To follow Jesus No turning back Good morning and happy Thanksgiving to each one of you. A very warm welcome to any visitors or newcomers joining us today. If you have no church home, we warmly welcome you into the community of faith here at Clarely Park. I invite you all for refreshments and fellowship in the lower hall after the service. Next Sunday, October 20th, we will welcome Elder Sonia McDonald to lead us in worship as our pastor will be the guest preacher at an anniversary service for Knox Presbyterian Church in Oshawa. I will be attending Amber Lee Presbyterian Church with the Presbytery of Pickering Visitation Committee. So please uphold us both in prayer as we minister in different ways. We look forward to resuming our potluck fellowship dinners once again. An African night will be held this Friday, October 18th at 6.30 p.m. And this will surely be an inspirational evening. So all are invited for good food, probably good fun and good fellowship. So hope to see you there. For all other announcements, please see the weekly news flash sent out Friday mornings, and if you're not on the mailing list, kindly let me know. These are all the announcements. Thanks. Food, fun, and fellowship, all in one evening. Wow. That'd be wonderful. Well, friends, we're here to worship the Lord together. If you're able, let's stand now as we begin our worship singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. responsive call to worship from Psalm 149. Our help is in the name of the Lord. O Lord, open my lips. The Lord's unfailing love and mercy never cease. 
We celebrate Thanksgiving today by singing some hymns and songs of thanksgiving to God. We plow the field and scatter, number 807. Let's pray together. Loving God, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, we want to express our gratitude and our praise to you. You take care of our needs. You love us more than we can even imagine. You've given us everything and we always need you. Thank you for never leaving us. Thank you for guiding us through life. Thank you for speaking to us personally and up close in Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, Father God, we pray this morning, would you give us a sense of your presence as we gather for worship? Grant us gratitude as we remember all your goodness and all your kindnesses to us. Penitence as we remember our sins and joy as we remember your love. Enable us now to lift up our hearts in humble prayer and fervent praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord said long ago, come now, let's settle the matter. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. 
Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Let us confess our sin to God and one another using our responsive prayer of confession. O God, our Father, we confess that we have often used your gifts carelessly and acted as though we were not grateful. Hear our prayer and in your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we enjoy the fruits of the, of the harvest, but forget they come from you, then Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we are full and satisfied, but ignore the cry of the hungry and those in need, then Father, in your mercy, When we are thoughtless and do not treat with respect or care the wonderful world you have made, then Father, in your mercy, when we store up goods for ourselves alone, as if there were no God and no heaven, then Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. Grant us thankful hearts and a loving concern for all people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, hear the good news. The Apostle Peter declared that all the prophets testify about Christ, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Know that in Jesus, God embraces you God forgives you. God will strengthen you to live a new life. Thanks be to God for his grace and mercy. And friends, we're here today on this Thanksgiving Sunday with gratitude. Gratitude to the Lord, of course, but gratitude that we're a part of a family of faith, that we're not having to live the Christian life all alone, that we belong to one another. And so I say to you, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Now, would you turn to a neighbor, especially someone whose name or face you don't recognize, and say hello to them in Jesus' name? <laughs> or even if you do. And peace to you, online church family. Let's sing a modern chorus, give thanks with a grateful heart. We'll repeat the first paragraph twice, and then we'll sing the second paragraph twice. Could you come up and join Rev Cav? Hi. 
Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see all of you. I'm going to borrow Karen's chair to sit on. I'll put it back, I promise, Karen. Well, good morning, children. How is everybody today? Are you having a good day so far? What's different about our church this morning? Do you notice anything different from the way it usually is? It's decor. There are decorations. Do you notice some of the decorations? Yeah? What do you notice? Yeah, what do you notice? There's what is it? Yeah, there's a pile of leaves. Oh, somebody didn't clean the church. No. <laughs> there's a pile of leaves. What else is there? Uh-huh, Eden. Yeah, there's a basket. And what's inside the basket? There's food. Anything else you notice that's a little different? Uh-huh. There's colored what? Oh, the corn. Yeah, the corn of different colors. And look to your right and your left on these pillars. Isn't that beautifully decorated? Those fall colors to remind us. Because what happens this time of year? What happens to the leaves on the trees? They fall down. The leaves fall down. It's an autumn time. Well, today, this weekend, is Thanksgiving. And that's something that once a year we're to be thankful to God every day. But especially once a year, it's a good time for us to remember to say thank you to God for all of the gifts that God has given us. And especially this time of year to remember and pray for and help people who maybe don't have as much as we do. You see the food in that basket? You know what we're going to do with that food? Is Rev Kev going to eat it after church this morning? <laughs> no. No, what are we going to, what do you think we're going to do with it? Uh -huh. Exactly, Eden. We're going to give it to people who need the food through our food bank. And you know, we do this every month, but especially today, this is a good reminder to us that we, we've been given so many wonderful gifts and we want to share God's blessing and share food with other people who may need it. So children, could you join me in a prayer? In fact, would you mind just putting your hand on a leaf or a pumpkin or that basket? Or, uh, so we're going to dedicate that food and the other food that we give that's out in the front of the, the church building. Yeah, let's pray. Yeah, you can hold that perfect. Thank you. Dear God, thank you that every day you give us so many gifts and we're so grateful. We want to say thank you, God because of your love, because of the life you've given us, because you give us fresh water to drink and good food to eat. And we pray, Lord, for people today who may be hungry or who are having difficulties in their life. Would you, would you send this food, Lord, to just the right families who need it? Would you also, Lord, remind us to always be generous and grateful for who you are and what you've done for us. Bless our children now, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, children. You can go downstairs now. Hey, Luke. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, Psalm 65. You can turn to it in page 583 if you're looking at the Bibles in your pew. And if you've got the big print one, that is on page um, 896. Psalm 65. And we'll read responsibly together. Praise is due to you, O God of Zion. And to you shall vows be performed. O oh, you answer prayer, to you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, 
you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those who you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance. O God of our salvation, you are the hope of all the ends to, of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains, you are girded with light. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at Earth's farthest bounds are all by your sons. You may make ways in the morning, and the evening shall for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You gently enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, and so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its riches, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with riches. The meadows close themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Good morning, church family. The scripture reading today is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. It can be found on page 208 in the Pew Bibles and page 1834 in the large print Bibles. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known the boldness, the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Denise.
Thank you, ladies. Have you heard the, on YouTube of Andrea Bocelli and Celine Dion singing that, the prayer? It, it, uh, it moves you to tears, and it's a prayer. What a wonderful, what a wonderful song that is. Well, friends, we're at the last of our series of sermons going through the book of Ephesians. I can't believe it's already 11 weeks, can you? <laughs> Well, in the first part of his letter to the Christians in the ancient city of Ephesus, the Apostle Paul marvels at all of the wondrous things the Lord has done. God is working out his mysterious, gracious master plan to bring all things in the universe under the authority of Jesus, his son. Whenever people put their trust in Christ, and follow him as their leader and their Lord, we receive the privilege of becoming God's children, God's adopted sons and daughters, part of God's new family. And we become active participants in God's plan to renew our world so that we can live in harmony again with God and with each other and with ourselves and with the creation around us. And in the second part of Paul's letter, beginning with chapter 4, Paul unfolds some of the practical implications of what it means to be God's children, urging us to live lives that are worthy of this great calling, to live a lifestyle of, of humility and gentleness and patience and love as we submit ourselves to each other out of reverence for Christ. But now in the very last part of his letter, Paul changes gears rather dramatically. It seems like an abrupt transition to go from talking about relationships with your family and in the workplace in chapter 5 to spiritual warfare in chapter 6. But Paul knew that he could not talk about harmonious relationships with one another without also discussing the challenge of spiritual conflict in our lives. Christian believers are invisibly but constantly challenged by evil spiritual forces that affect our relationships and many other areas of our lives. Friends, here in Ephesians 6, Paul speaks about the devil and other destructive demonic forces that are the implacable enemy of God and God's people. Now, Paul doesn't go into all the details about these powers. He doesn't spend time reflecting on the origin or the source of this evil. Paul isn't writing to satisfy our curiosity about these things, although they're worth discussing and pondering. As much as Paul's concern is to warn us and equip us to stand strong and stand firm in our faith in Christ. Nikki Gumbel, the leader of the Alpha program, which many of you have participated in, tells a story of a man named Bruce Strether, who was a, who was a successful lawyer and was a convinced atheist. He never went to church, even though his family did. Most weekends, he played golf. But because of considerable pressure and persuasion by his wife and his three teenage daughters, Bruce came on the Alpha course. Nikki says he was extremely argumentative and hostile. None of the sessions had any impact on him until towards the end of the course, he heard the talk, How can I resist evil? And afterwards, he came up to Nikki and told him, In my work as a lawyer, I have seen so much evil. I've always believed in the power of evil, but tonight it struck me that if there is a power of evil, it makes sense to believe there's also a power for good. And that night, Bruce became a Christian 
And ever since, Nikki reports, he's been a committed member of that congregation in London, England, and has a powerful and effective ministry affecting the lives of many people. Friends, right now in our world, turn on the television, look at the headlines on the internet, look at your paper. The world is struggling against so many global evils. The evils of war in the Middle East and Europe, terrorism, racial injustice, human trafficking, the, tragi the tragic plight of so many refugees, deadly viruses, hunger and poverty, the destruction of the environment, corrupt governments, political strife and conflict, and countless other local and international issues. And of course, every one of us faces struggles with evil in our own lives, in the forms of temptation and sin and personal addictions and destructive habits we just can't seem to get the better of. You know, the Bible is very realistic about this struggle. In the Old Testament, we read about physical battles against the forces of evil, but in the New Testament, the struggle is more often described as a spiritual battle. As Paul puts it in our reading that Denise shared with us a moment ago, our struggle is not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The Greek word for struggle here is the word for hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Roman soldiers in mind. The old King James Version calls it wrestling. We wrestle. Notice how numerous and powerful these, these forces are. Rulers, authorities, dark cosmic powers, forces of evil. There are forces ranged against us that would like nothing better than to discourage or distract or defeat us so that we will become weakened in our faith, compromised in our moral values and choices, and frustrated in our walk with God. Many of us are weak as Christians because we've forgotten that. We become foolishly self-confident when we forget that we're in a battle with forces that want to do us harm. We forget that we even have an enemy and we grow proud or complacent. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, if you've never read it, you really should someday. C.S. Lewis in The Screwtape Letters wrote, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devil. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Most of us, I think, at least most of us here, fall into the former category of disbelieving or ignoring evil spiritual powers. But a Christianity that discounts the supernatural, a Christianity that arms itself only with the wisdom and the resources of this world, with our own strength, becomes a sitting duck for the powers arrayed against us. Friends, our passage today shows us that the battle is won through the victorious power of the Lord. Our battle, says one Catholic theologian, uh, Father Raniero Cantalamisa, wow, there's a name. It, he writes, our battle is, is against the triple alliance, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the enemy around us, the enemy within us, the enemy above us. 
Our reading today reminds us that the battle against these enemies is won through the victorious power of our risen Lord and the Holy Spirit. But relying on God's victorious power does not mean that we're to be passive. We need to do something. Paul insists that in order to win the battle, you need to take responsibility for your life and be strong in the Lord, he says in verse 10. We need to take action. And Paul uses phrases like, like getting dressed in the morning. He says, put on and withstand and stand firm. We have to put on God's armor for the battle. Even though that evil day Paul speaks about in verse 13 could be a reference to the, the day of final judgment, Paul is reminding us that times of pressure and testing and challenge will come to us on a regular basis. I mean, just think back on the last few weeks of your life. What pressures, what challenges, what opposition, what difficulties have you engaged in? When that happens... We need to actively resist evil by replacing some bad habits with good habits. And in verses 14 through 18, Paul outlines seven life-changing habits that we should adopt in the struggle against the devil's schemes. And Paul uses the analogy of physical armor that was worn by Roman soldiers as the imagery of spiritual armor used by believers in our fight against evil. Now notice that most of the equipment Paul describes is, is to defend, not to attack. His point here is to remind Christians that we have been given many gifts by God which can provide protection and the ability to stand our ground when we're under spiritual attack. Roman soldiers, of course, used to wear a belt, a leather belt around their waist, upon which they would hang their sword, and upon which they could strap down their tunic and their armor, so they could have free, unencumbered movement during times of battle. Their belts were a foundational piece of equipment. And I know that's true because one day last week, I forgot to wear my belt. <laughs> when I went to Metro and I was pulling up my pants the whole time. You need your belt. It's foundational. <laughs> and so Paul says that the belt of truth is a foundation for our Christian life. We're to focus on being people of truth, truthful people. Transparency and authenticity are the opposite of hypocrisy. We also need to focus on the truth of Christian teaching that's revealed to us in the Bible. And both kinds of truth, truthful behavior and truthful belief, are personified in Jesus, who said what? I am the truth. Lying and deceit are tactics of the enemy. But this piece of armor reminds us to keep our focus on the truth of Christ, who helps us live lives of integrity and sincerity by which we can fight evil. Next, Paul mentions the breastplate of righteousness. A Roman soldier's breastplate was a kind of chain mail armor that protected his vital organs, kind of like a, like a bulletproof vest. And here Paul reminds us that Jesus died so that we could have the righteousness of God. What does that mean? When we trust Jesus to be our Savior, we are put into a right relationship with God so that when God looks at us, he sees the purity and the wholeness of Jesus, his Son. In Christ, we become God's beloved. And that motivates us to live lives of openness and honesty with God and with other people. We've nothing left to prove. We belong to God. And when we fail or when we fall, we can just get up. Because God is still our Father, 
and we remain God's beloved children no matter what. The breastplate of righteousness. Next, Paul mentions a soldier's shoes, which obviously were a vital part of a soldier's wardrobe. Shoes not only protect your feet, but they enable us to walk further than if you had to walk around barefoot, right? And here Paul uses that, it says that a part of a Christian's armor is to put shoes on your feet to make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. I think Paul has a verse from the Old Testament in mind when he wrote this, from the prophet Nahum, says this, look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. You know, the devil hates the good news about Jesus, the gospel, because it is God's power to change our lives for the good. And so Paul asked the Ephesian Christians to pray for him. Pray that when I speak, a message will be given to me so that I can fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. And that should be our prayer too. To be actively involved, to be ready to share our faith with the people who interact with us every day. To tell them what difference Jesus made in our lives. Well, the fourth piece of Roman, a Roman soldier's armor was a large oblong shield made from wood and iron and then covered with linen and animal hides. It was useful for protecting soldiers from arrows. Sometimes armies who fought the Romans soak their arrows in flammable pitch and they lit them on fire with the goal not so much of killing a soldier but setting their clothes on fire and causing them to break, break from the unit and panic and run. And arrows like this are shot at Christians too, says Paul. Have you ever been hit by a flaming arrow of the evil one? Those arrows are things like false guilt or a sense of shame or doubt or disobedience, or paralyzing fear. Who's making you feel afraid? Who's making you ashamed? Who's making you feel guilty? That's not God. And when those arrows strike us, they can be paralyzing. When that happens, Paul urges us to take the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, when Roman soldiers, this was one of their classic formations, they would stand side by side and put their shields together like this. It provided considerable protection. And so it is with a believer's shield of faith. <laughs> Friends, there's strength in numbers. That's why we need each other. That's one reason that we worship together every week. Christianity is not a lone ranger religion. Praise and teaching and fellowship together that builds up our faith so that when those arrows strike us, and they will, they lose their power. Our faith in God can carry us through the difficult times, especially as we rely on one another. Fifth comes the helmet of salvation. The Roman helmet was a heavy metal head covering lined with felt or sponge. It gave major protection to the soldier's head from any but the most severe kind of blows. And salvation is like that. The sure knowledge that in Jesus Christ we have been saved, that we are secure, that the outcome of the battle is already known because God wins, that's our final defense against Satan. If we belong to Christ, we are eternally secure no matter what may happen to us, no matter what threatens us. As Romans 8.39 says, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
That's our sure salvation. And the final piece of armor that's mentioned by Paul is what? A sword. Roman soldiers used a short, stabbing sword for personal combat. And notice that in this list of, of uh, essential armor, the sword is the only offensive weapon mentioned. And so it is for Christians. Paul says we are to wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We can use the words and promises of the Bible when we're feeling under attack. Just like Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness. We can claim those words. We can read them. We can speak them out loud. We can ask for God's help using them. And we're to speak and share and declare the word of God and the power of the Spirit because we know that God's word is powerful. As God said through the prophet Isaiah long ago, my word will not return to me empty. I will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I send it. God's judging, saving word, God's message of reconciling love is the most important thing we have to share with people around us. And finally, Paul urges the Ephesians, to keep praying. Now, note, Paul doesn't say that prayer is the seventh weapon in the Christian's arsenal against evil. Rather, prayer is the foundation of all spiritual reality and spiritual warfare. Listen again to verse 18. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplications, prayers, for the saints, for us. We are to pray in the Spirit. Just as the Bible, the Word of God, is the sword of the Spirit, so too prayer is to be guided by the Spirit. We're being called to make prayer a way of life, letting our prayers rise up from God's Spirit inside of us, praising, confessing, thanking and asking for God's help for other people as well as ourselves. Prayer is a powerful weapon. Mary, Queen of Scots, said once, I fear John Knox's prayers more than an army of 10,000 men. And notice what Paul goes on to say. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known the boldness of the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. See, where is Paul, friends? Hmm? He's in prison. Paul is writing this letter and praying while he's in prison. So what does Paul pray for? For more comfort? For peace, for safety, for deliverance and release? No. He asks for courage and confidence to proclaim the good news of Jesus even more boldly wherever he is. Dear people, we're in a spiritual battle, and the evil force, spiritual forces are working to sow doom in our world and to destroy our lives. Only the gospel can overcome the powers of evil. On our own, we're powerless against them. But with the armor of God and the strength of Jesus and the power of God's spirit, we can experience the Lord's victory. As believers, we need to be wary of the devil and protect ourselves from his power but we do not need to live in fear. The power of the devil is no match for God's power. And our focus isn't centered on spiritual warfare, but on joyfully following and loving and serving Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lord God, Thank you that although on our own we are powerless, 
with the armor that you provide and with the strength of Jesus and with the power of your Holy Spirit, we can experience your victory. Help us, Lord, to experience some of that victory this week, we pray. Amen. As recipients of abundant life in Christ, let's offer our gifts to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures, hear me. God of wonders, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and your mercy in our lives. Receive them with our gratitude so that people can know the riches of your love in the word made flesh, Jesus our Savior. Amen. Friends, today on Thanksgiving Sunday, we're going to do something a little different. I'll offer some prayers in a moment, but I'd like us now popcorn style in a word or a phrase or a sentence at the most, something that we want to thank God for, a person, an event, a memory, an anticipation. What do we want to say thanks to God our Father for this day? Okay? Lord, now hear us, we pray, as we offer our thanks to you, your people, Lord, to your throne of grace. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your healing touch upon me. Thank you for Canada for welcoming yes. so many of us from all over the world. That's right. Father, for the beauty of the earth, for the changing seasons, for the sights and sounds and smells and tastes of all that your good creation provides to us, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. Father, we pray for our homes, our families, our friends, and all those that we love. 
that this weekend can bring a time for renewing our relationships, for recreation and play, for peace and joy. We pray for those whose time will be spent caring for other people, others that they love. May this weekend, Lord, we ask that, that you would bless all carers and all for whom this weekend is a time of work, especially those in health and social care, for those in the emergency services. We pray for those who are close to death. We ask that you'd be near to all those whose lives are drawing to an end and console and strengthen all who are watching and waiting with them. We pray for those who work in hospices and all health care chaplains like our friend, the Reverend Linda Larmer, in her ministry to the sick. Lord, today we pray for the people of Israel and in Gaza and in Lebanon. Bring justice and peace to that land of your birth, Lord Jesus, to the holy land that is so troubled by pain and anger and mutual resentments. Console those who've lost loved ones Protect innocent men, women, and children. Remove from the hearts of all people the passions that keep alive the spirit of hatred and war. In your goodness, Lord, bring true shalom for the sake of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Lord. Father, we pray for any who feel like they've lost hope. We ask you, Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to draw near to those who are feeling isolated or anxious or burdened today, who are feeling shame or abandoned or helpless. We pray, too, for the compassion and courage to reach out to people that we know who are in distress. Lord, we pray especially for those in our own church family and loved ones who need your touch of healing. We ask, Lord, for Leodi's husband, Leslie, and brother, Tony, asking your healing on their lives. We pray for Vanessa and Emmanuel's uh, friend in Trinidad, Neil Singh, who is in hospital there. Almighty God, you've made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till we find our rest in you. Put your love inside of us and draw us to yourself and bring us at last to your heavenly city where we will see Jesus face to face. And now as our Savior taught us, let's pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Our final hymn is number 802, For the Fruits of All Creation.
Friends, go forth now this week to love and to serve the Lord, our bountiful provider, our Savior, and our friend. And now receive his blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and upon all those that you love, now and forever. Amen. Amen.